My name is Dana Goulet, and I program Canadian Features for TIFF, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the world premiere of Anthropocene, the Human Epic. <laughs> to begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. This film is eligible for the Canada Goose Award for Best Canadian Feature Film, the Grolsch People's Choice Award, and the Grolsch People's Choice Documentary Award. So vote for your favorite film, hint, hint, at tiff.net slash vote. Um, we would like to thank Mongrel Media and Seville International for providing us with the film. And this team needs no introduction. Um, this is the third collaboration between award-winning photographer Edward Bertinsky and acclaimed filmmakers Jennifer Bejewal and Nicholas de Pontier, um, at, following their work on manufactured landscapes and watermark. Um, this collaboration is one of the most significant collaborations in documentary film in recent memory. Uh, their latest film together is an expansive deep dive into the enormous impact that we as a species are having on the planet. The scope of the film is astonishing. The wide vistas of industrial landscapes and the mammoth machines that extract from the earth seem otherworldly, and yet it is our demand that creates the extraction. The film is a unique experience that is at once visceral and emotive, and arresting and yet vast and spacious as if to invoke us to think more deeply about what our impact is. I am thrilled to welcome Jennifer Bejewal, Ed Bertinsky, and Nicholas de Pontier. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you to TIFF, our, our great collaborator in film since we started over 20 years ago. Um, our films have been playing here, and we're very grateful for this festival and what it does for our city and our country and internationally. Um, I have some people to introduce here on the stage. Um, in addition to Nick and Ed, we have uh, Rose Bolton and Nora Lorway, our composers for the film. We have, the music's really great. We have our longtime producing partner, Daniel Iron. Um, our associate producer, Nadia Tavazani. And our longtime and sometimes long suffering editor, <laughs> Roland Schlimm. <laughs> It's a real pleasure to be here tonight, um, and what I've learned uh, in terms of the difference between being a stills photographer and uh, working with film is you need a village to make a film, and there's so many people to thank. Uh, the first person I want to thank is Julia Johnston, my life partner, who uh, without her, she's been involved in all aspects of the Anthropocene, and without her, I think we would have all imploded, so thank you, Julia, for your hard work. Uh, the next person I'd like to thank is Nicholas Mativier, who has, again, been a longtime collaborator and has been instrumental in, in building uh, my career. And uh, he's been my kind of all, longtime art dealer. And uh, without him, I probably wouldn't have gotten this far. So thank you, Nicholas. Uh, my amazing uh, studio colleagues who I think are all here tonight, uh, thank you for all that you do for me. Um, my wonderful da daughters, Megan and Katya, thank you and thanks for your patience. Uh, I think this film took us to 20 countries, so uh, traveling was certainly on the agenda through a lot of that, so thank you for your patience and, and your love. Um, 
Also, I'd like to thank the supporters, many of them who are here today, of the Anthropocene Project. Uh, also, our, our corporate supporters, TELUS and Scotiabank. Uh, thank you very much. And also, I'd like to thank the Art Gallery of Ontario and the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, the, uh, the Anthropocene Project will be opening as exhibits in, uh, in both those locations, and they'll be opening on September the 28th. Uh, so thank you for, for supporting the project and supporting us, and, and, and uh, it's been an incredible voyage. And mostly and personally, I would certainly like to thank Jennifer and Nick, uh, longtime collaborators. I've learned so much from them. Uh, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, I've always had a fascination with film, and they've been the greatest teachers I could ever have. So thank you, guys. Right, right back at you, Ed, for the um, for the learning and for the thanks. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be able to do what you love, and for us, that's making documentary films. Um, it's also a privilege to uh, have partners that, when you're at it for a long time, you develop uh, trustful relationships with. And these films absolutely do not get made without these partnerships. Uh, so for us in this case, um, as in many before, uh, that includes uh, TMN and the Bell Network uh, with Tina Apostolopoulos, TVO Jan Jankovic and um, Linda Fong, Telefilm certainly, Stephanie Azam, Rogers twice on this one, Robin Mursky, uh, the CMF and the OMDC, aka Ontario Creates, the TELUS Fund and the Bell Fund are our partners. Um, our team at Mercury Films, our small but vital team, um, is an absolute hive of uh, talent and dedication and I'm inspired every day I walk in there with you guys and all these young uh, brains. I'm so happy to be a part of that team. Uh, this film will be sold by Seville International around the world. Uh, again, our our trusted partners and will be uh, released on September 28th in theaters by Mongrel Media. Tell your friends. In our frenetic uh, modern world, I find, and probably many of us do, that it's increasingly a challenge to find moments of reflection and meditation, and those are very important moments. I think for us, the idea of the Anthropocene and the reason why we made this film uh, invited us to examine and interrogate the whole human project on a planetary scale and in geological time. Uh, so we hope that you have that moment tonight. So film is community, as we have all noted, and we had wonderful production crews which expanded and contracted all around the world. As Ed said, we were in 20 countries. We did completely offset the project, carbon offset the project through less emissions. Um, but these pr crews expanded and contracted with the constants being Mike Reed and Jim Panu, so we thank them. Um, our longtime wonderful pro production teams, Pat and Frank and Mark at Technicolor, and Lou and Dave, Lou Solikovsky and Dave Rose at Sim. It's my favorite part of the process because you get the luxury of concentrating on one extremely specific thing, which we never get to do really, um, that then makes the whole infinitely better. And so we thank them and, and they are here tonight as well. Roland Schlimm uh, needs a holiday. <laughs> this is the fifth feature doc that we've made together and there have been two back to back because we, we sort of put this one on hold to do the Tragically Hip film last year for obvious reasons that was time sensitive. So Roland has, we've been working flat out for over two years. Um, Roland always elevates the work and our particular process of collaboration uh, in the edit room is always totally engrossing. It's like putting together an enormous puzzle but never seeing that picture on the cover that you get to look at at the beginning, but never knowing what that is. <laughs> and it's a, uh, it's, it's a wonderful process, so thank you, Roland. Um, in closing, Anthropocene, Anthropocene is not a household word yet. Um, 
we are trying in this film and in the museum exhibition to draw attention to the scientific facts of human impact and how these are manifest in places and contexts and ecosystems and communities all around the world. We are all implicated um, in wildly varying degrees when you consider the unequal distribution of resources globally. Uh, but something that I thought about almost daily over the five-year course of this project was, how do we move forward with an understanding of our implication without being crippled by the knowledge of it? And how can we actually be inspired by the knowledge of it? So I think these are questions for all of us. Thank you. There will be a Q&A following the screening and enjoy the film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, welcome back to the stage. So we are going to open up a Q&A to the audience, um, but before we do, I want to start by asking you all how you begin to tackle a topic so vast. And I know that this collaboration was over five years, so if you could tell us a little bit about that process, that would be great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, it was interesting because we started with the categories that the Anthropocene scientists had put together, and and we distilled them a bit to our own to our own needs. But like anthroturbation, techno fossils, many of these things, climate change, were things that they were working with. So we used them as our head categories, and and quite frankly, in the work that we've done in the past, and the work that I've done in the past, these you know we had already been familiar with those subjects. So. Uh, what we tried to do, uh, by and large, was to search for the greatest examples that kind of had two, two check boxes. One, that visually it was compelling, that it, it drew us in, and it had scale to it, because we wanted to really show the scale and the impact uh, of, of human intervention in, in, in the landscape. So those are the real things that we looked for, and we parsed like thousands of images, and we had this board in my, in my uh, office, you know, and we just kept moving images around using stuff that we found on the internet or research through books. And we had four researchers on and off on the project over two years just to get down to the subject matter. I mean, the, the, has anybody read Elizabeth Colbert's The, the Sixth Extinction? It's a great book, yeah. um, if you haven't. And, uh, there's a chapter that she kind of mentions the Anthropocene Working Group, and she talks a bit about what they're doing, and she talks about this idea of the epoch. And uh, when we were talking about doing another project, and I remember saying, I'm not doing another amor amorphous film about water, which is just like a huge <laughs> subject that has no structure. Um, and, uh, and so then these scientists, and we thought, wow, this, this is a filter for looking at impact um, and they became a kind of fo focusing point for for us that was really incredible they were the inspiration and the research really for the whole thing and when we started we hoped for the film uh, and we were led to believe that there might actually be a kind of crucible moment in their uh, in the work of this group who have to present this evidence to a very conservative governing body, the International Commission on Stratigraphy. And these are all geologists and, and you know, they, they, they move quite slowly, we find. So there was no vote <laughs> in, the, in the time period um, that, that we were filming Five in. Five year time period. We were hoping they would vote, there would be a kind of Hollywood ending, and yes, we're, we're in the epoch, and, and there wasn't. So in the end, the, I think it was the ideas that they were um, passing back and forth amongst themselves in their research, which was getting more defined, but that became for us the really interesting central organizing principle. Are there any questions out there? Um, yes, right here. So the question is first for Edward, what were the most technically challenging places you went? And then I'll go to Jennifer afterwards. Well, 
Uh, I think the uh, underground mine in Berezniki was uh, actually one of the most uh, intriguing and challenging locations. Number one, there's no light down there, and so we had to bring in all the light. And number two, there was uh, one, we got a chance to play with some new technology called photogrammetry, and we were able to shoot. There's a shot where you're looking at one of those medallions, and it pulls back, and it goes, and it, and it pushes into another one. Well, that was... Uh, a 3D software that um, pulled together probably like 15,000 images rendered in computer and that is actually a, a reality rendered within the computer and then the shot is a rendering through the data. Um, so because there's no way you could light that underground in a mine. So technically I would say that was our kind of really uh, a challenging and interesting um, uh, kind of a feat. And the question for Jennifer was, where did you want to go that you couldn't get to? Well, there were a number of locations. I tried to resurrect the location of Lake Karachay in Russia, which we, I wanted to do for Watermark, and Ed and Nick said, no way, because you have to wear a hazmat suit just to stand in front of it. It's one of the most radioactive places on Earth. So that was no. I tried to do that again. And it looks like an ordinary lake. Um, and then we tried to go to the Spratly Islands. Do you remember that? Because, oh, yeah. yeah. China <laughs> wasn't China, China. These, these sort of created islands in the South China Sea. And literally, uh, our, our um, produ sort of producer fixer in China, Noah Weinswick, said, we'll be shot by just even trying to go there. We're not going. And he's usually game for a challenge. Yeah. But, but I will say that in, in Norilsk, and, and we, it took us a year to get access to Norilsk. It's a very difficult place. Even ordinary Russians can't go there. It's a closed city for strategic reasons because it has such important mines and also because it's, you can only fly in there. It's, it's in Siberia. It's north of the Arctic Circle. So that took a long time. And then when we did get there, um, because we interviewed those women in the copper smelter, we literally got arrested, detained, um, and we were fingerprinted and we were kept in this room until we admitted that we were journalists who had come in there with the purposes of kind of telling a terrible story about Noros. We said, we're not, this is an art project, we're just showing this, and it went back and forth. They said, you have to say you're journalists and you lied, and we said, we're not saying that we lied, and it was <laughs> hours and hours, and, and finally they let us go, but then they dogged the crew for the rest of the trip in Russia, so that was a bit scary. Any other questions? Yes, down here. So the question is about um, the issue of overpopulation and if you have any ideas about solutions that seem viable. I get that one? Yeah, great. <laughs> um, there's, no, I, I'm not gonna try and answer, I can't answer that question, of course. And, uh, but but I, get, I think it maybe loops us back to the to the philosophy of, of our approach, the, the non-prescriptive, um, non-didactic kind of witnessing. And we've probably gone farther, you know, in the, in the line, in the sand, in this one, in terms of, of an agenda. Um, but uh, there's a place for polemic filmmaking. God love the people who, who have that argument and their own agenda and the courage of their convictions and they can be very um, uh, persuasive, uh, absolutely. I think our philosophy is more, let's try and, and witness and bring as many people into this because we're all implicated. These things aren't happening over there. They're, they're, this, is, this is a global perspective that, that we're trying to um, show in this film, and so the solutions are all of us. It's not pointing fingers, it's not, it's not dividing. Um, so what the solutions are, I don't know. I'm a filmmaker and a, and a cinematographer, but the hope is that by making uh, a film like this and by trying to ripple it out in, in as wide a pool as possible, uh, hopefully all around the world, the more people who see it will have their own transformation 
uh, their own answer to those questions in things that are immediate to them and within their uh, capacities and, and competencies. We have time for one more question. So, the tunnel. so it's another question about access to some of these locations and what is the process of gaining access, especially to the tunnel? I think Ed should answer because he's been doing it all of his life um, uh, and so successfully and it's an enormous amount of work, but just specifically to the Swiss tunnel, I can't believe they let me and Mike Reed strap the pipes and everything to the front of that train. And the, the engineer was showing off and got it up to 200 kilometers an hour. I'm like, oh, please don't, you know, make it go under the wheels. And it's, it's, full, it's full don't of people. No, they let, and, us, they let us go all the way through the tunnel. And those opening ceremonies, if you can believe it, that's all real. Like, they, they did that. <laughs> they did that. It, it's a little crazy. And, but we should talk about, the, uh, about Humbach because that mine with the bagger, um, the bagger 291, now there's a 293, which is even bigger than the bagger 291. Um, it is the biggest mine in Germany. And I, I don't know, I think they kind of knew when we were there. You, you, what well, do you they think? originally yeah. said no. And then I found out through my dealer in Berlin that one of my collectors of my work is, sits on the board of RWE. He may not be collecting my work anymore after this film. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the one I'm worried about. But it is. It's kind of trying to find, you know, the first thing is you, you don't take, accept no as an answer because that's always the first answer. Why bother? Why, you know, even invite the possibility of controversy to come into their corporation or whatever. So I always expect a no or a very, very cool response as the first response. And then it's a slow chipping away at it. And I think it's also really important that you know, our work has always kind of taken the position that you know, it's revelatory, not accusatory. So we're not saying that you're bad or good, this is a necessary process to provide for the ever-growing populations, you know, 7.5 billion moving to eight. It, it takes a lot of scale in that, and we often point out to the corporations, the reason why we're at your doorstep is that you are the largest example of a coal mine in the world, or you have the largest machine in the world. And I think that intrigues the corporations in that, you know, they appreciate that they're doing something and they're providing a service to humanity at a scale and we're there as a kind of interpreters of, the, of that scale to kind of bridge that disconnect that we all have in urban centers to the kinds of things that are necessary out in the world that provide for our daily lives. So when we coach it and couch it in that way, it starts to soften up. And often, like Russia was a year and a half, RWE was a year and a half. It's letter writing, it's, it's, it's just cajoling and, and letting them know that you know, it's up to you. I don't, we're letting them know it's a fairly neutral position. It's not saying you're bad. It's just saying this is one of the processes that we're engaged in. But all of it accumulated, as this film points out, is starting to create huge problems for the planet. Yeah, maybe it's we're all bad. Not just you, <laughs> but all of us are we're bad. All, we're that, all but, I mean, that, that lignite mine, if you can believe that they, it, it's still profitable for them to have, have relocated all of those towns, literally four, two more. So imagine six towns, a whole highway had to be moved for the, the it's called a lignite soft brown uh, yeah. coal, um, which is not a particularly efficient form of coal, but still ne necessary for Germany's energy use. So. Ed, Jennifer, Nick, thank you so much for the film, and thank you guys for being here. Thank you all so much. Thank you.